Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Astro Chats. We're excited to have you with us again today, twice in one day. Uh, for those of you that were with us this morning, we spoke to Jordan Eagle, a graduate student, all about uh, Pulsar Wind Nebula. And this afternoon, we're lucky enough to actually have her advisor here with us today, Dr. Daniel Castro. Thanks for being with us, Daniel. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, before we start our conversation, I just want to remind our audience out there that you can join in on the conversation using hashtag AstroChat on Twitter and on Facebook. I'll be monitoring both throughout the conversation, so ask away and I'll ask them of Daniel. Um, so today, before we get started in your science topic that you're going to share with us, which is pretty exciting, exploding stars is always fun, um, I thought I'd ask you a little bit about being an advisor and what that really means in science, kind of what do you do as an advisor of a graduate student or even undergraduate students? And so uh, most of what we do is talk. <laughs> We're just there as a, it's, it's a really important role, I, I find. I, I, had met, I had several different advisors before I got to this point. And of course, what you end up doing is, is necessary for you to become an advisor at some point in your career. Um, but it's, it's great. It's basically you introduce students to the type of science that you do and you help them set off uh, on their own and basically encourage them to do science their own way, but using the tools that you already have. Uh, so people do different uh, science in very different ways. People think in different ways. And that's part of the richness of science um, as it's practiced today. Um, so it's not like a rigid thing where Jordan now lives exactly the same life that I lead and, you know, writes um, uh, computer programs the same way that I do and analyzes data the same way that I do. All I did was basically give her the tools to get started on the process. And then just, I am just a head check for her once in a while to say, yeah, that seems really interesting or, ooh, maybe you, you shouldn't be wasting your time going down that rabbit hole because I did five years ago and it was a waste <laughs> of time. That type of thing. It's basically a, a sort of a support role, but it's super important in science because, you know, um, once you get into uh, very deep into some of these scientific topics, it, it feels as though you need someone who's there as your base camp. Let's put it that way. So somewhere where you can return and ask questions and and you know, just just double check that what you're thinking makes sense. Great, yeah, I think that is incredibly valuable uh, to have someone to bounce your ideas off with and get feedback from. Uh, I liked your point about helping also steer away from difficult from, from things that maybe somebody else has already done. Right? You have you also, as an advisor, have more ex years of experience in the field, so you maybe have a deeper knowledge of what people have done, what people haven't done than someone new to the field. Totally, yeah, you're totally right. It's, um, it's very important because you, you get this panoramic view of the, of the context of the subject that you're studying that it's only accrued through time. It's not like, oh yeah, no, this person is more intelligent than this other person and hence this person understands the context better. No, it's more of a, the type of thing that you just need to read many hundreds of papers and then eventually you start getting a picture of where science is today regarding the topic that you're interested in. And, the, and a student can't be expected to learn all of that in a few weeks and then just know where we stand. <laughs> so we are kind of, we try to summarize this big picture thing for students all of the time. So that, that's, a, that's a really, really um, important point for sure. Well, great. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit about what it means to be an advisor. Um, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about advising and mentoring later uh, in our discussion, but I know I'm excited to hear uh, what you have for us about exploding deaths of stars. Uh, so I think you brought some slides with, slides with you to share? I did. I'm just okay. going to share my screen now. Great. And there we go. And you can see those clearly now? Yes, we can. Excellent. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the brightest explosions in the sky that we can see from here. Um, there are the um, explosive deaths of stars. They're called supernovae explosions. And my particular area of research is studying 
what's left over after the star explodes and how that teaches us about the star that was there before and about the mechanism of the explosion. And, and I specialize in looking at these uh, in X-rays. And I'll explain in a second why, uh, especially X-rays is a, is a good way of studying uh, this type of phenomena. Now, th this first picture, I'm keeping my pictures of supernova uh, remnants for a little bit later because they're very beautiful, et cetera. But I'm going to start you off with a picture of the satellite that I work for. Um, this is a satellite that we help run for NASA uh, from our base here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we help plan how it observes. We, ha we uh, help keep it uh, healthy and busy and efficient, um, and it's called Chandra. It's a little bit like the famous Hubble uh, Space Telescope, but it specializes in looking at X-rays. Um, now, you might think, okay, so why X-rays? Why it's so interesting about the X-ray band? X-rays are just a type of light, a very energetic type of light, more energetic than the one that we can see with our uh, eyes. Um, it's very it's, it's very peculiar because it can go through some things that uh, normal light doesn't like. That's why you go to the doctor uh, in order to uh, get your X-rays of you know your bones, etc. It's because X-rays go very easily uh, through your skin and flesh, but it doesn't go all that easily through the bones. So basically, it reflects, and that's why you get this picture of your bones. Now, in astronomy. Uh, it turns out that it's a really interesting tool of, uh, of as a way to look at the sky. Um, and, and what I'm showing you here, it's basically what uh, um, observations of the sky used to look like hundreds of years ago. This is, this is a map of the, a specific side of the sky, a, a constellation called Cassiopeia, made by a Danish astronomer called Tycho Brahe. This is in 1575. Two, uh, that he made this map. And, and there's just uh, funky names at the top uh, for each of the stars that he has in the, in the map, A, B, he, you know, he letters them as A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, but you can see the, the last one, the I, which is the brightest one right at the top of uh, the image. Um, it's actually uh, labeled Nova Stella, which just means new star. So it turns out that he looks at this piece of the sky very often in his life, this particular astronomer. And one day it turns out that there's this super bright new star in the sky. Uh, it's super interesting also that it was so bright that you could see it during the day. That's how bright this star was. And, and he was, you know, he was very curious about this and that's why he named it the Noah Stella, this uh, new star. Uh, and it turns out um, that it was basically uh, one star that used to be there, which we couldn't see because it was too far away, that uh, exploded. And basically, uh, as it exploded, it it became super bright for a few days, at least to the to in the optical light, which is what we can see with our eyes. Now. What does that patch of the sky look like today? So this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of, uh, of that part of the sky. You, you see there's a bunch of stars on, uh, in the sky, nothing particularly different from this patch of the sky than, than uh, any other. Uh, now, what if we put on top of that, the X-ray view that Chandra gives us? So that's what you get when you see uh, this, this same space patch of sky, but with Chandra, which is an X-ray telescope. Now you see all of this structure. Yep. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, how big of, how much of the night sky would we be looking at in this image? Because that looks We're looking, compared to the star. Yes, it's actually tiny. We're looking at basically uh, uh, the needle point as you point it towards the sky. It's, it's much smaller than the size of the moon, for example, uh, this patch of the sky that we're seeing. Um, so it, it's really, really tiny. So Chandra has extremely good resolution, as does the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay. Um, so compared to the stars, it's still huge, but 
tiny, tiny piece of our night sky that we're looking at. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, you can, you can compare it to the size of stars, which are, you know, all around it. And they're tiny, tiny, tiny uh, points in the sky. And basically they only have a size because uh, our ability to resolve the light is not all that good. Um, if, if we would see them clearly, we wouldn't actually see them it's spread in the image at all. Wow. Um, but in this case, it's a, we are looking at a tiny bit of the sky specifically. Now, um, so the reason that this is uh, so bright in the X-rays is because once the star exploded, it uh, produced this shock that moves outwards. So basically the stuff that used to make the star gets ejected outwards very, very fast. And it starts uh, compressing and heating up all of the material in space that surrounded the star before it blew up. Okay. And as that show goes on, it compresses and heats stuff to the temperatures that we can see only in the X-ray band. It's, it's so hot that it doesn't actually shine light in the uh, optical side of uh, the X-rays or not very much, but in the, in the X-ray band is super, super bright because the X-ray band is exactly where we see um, uh, temperatures of uh, millions of degrees wow. Kelvin. So millions of degrees Celsius as well. Uh, many millions of Fahrenheit. This is very, very hot gas uh, that has been shocked by this very, very fast moving shock. And if you're wondering, well, how fast are we talking? In this particular uh, image that I'm showing you, the shocks are moving. I, this is a rough estimate, but about 10 million miles per hour. Wow. So yes, so we're talking about much faster than a truck <laughs> hitting, <laughs> hitting something then. So, so that's basically why x-rays. Well, x-rays, it turns out, are very, very good at looking at any gas that is um, millions of degrees hot, okay? So there's a lot of in the sky that we've learned since we started looking in the x-rays, which is very recent. It's only in the last 60 years that we started looking at the sky in, in this band. Um, and we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about things that we didn't know all that much about. Now, a quick uh, summary about Chandra itself. I'm showing you here a diagram before it was born. You can see the, the wings on the side. Those are the solar panels, which is where it gets its uh, power from. Um, you can see the stem, this, this long thing. Uh, it's actually separating the thing that we have closest to us, which is where the mirrors are. Um, and, and most telescopes are, um, for, for everyone to understand, um, most telescopes nowadays are actually mirrors that focus the light from the sky into uh, a small uh, detector. Um, so basically the mirrors are housed in this uh, golden bit that you see right uh, sort of towards you. And right at the back is where the uh, science instruments are. So basically the light comes in, um, you, your mouse, um, you can see your mouse if you want to point something out. Oh, fantastic. Um, so the light comes in through here in this area of the space telescope, and then it actually gets focused by the, by the uh, mirrors into detectors that are all the way up here. And what you can see in the bottom left of the corner is basically how uh, this telescope is orbiting uh, around Earth every day. It goes around Earth about once every 64 hours in a fairly long um, uh, orbit. Uh, as a matter of fact, the furthest it gets out is about a third of the way to the moon. So it's a, it's a pretty big orbit in comparison to many other uh, telescopes. We wouldn't be able to send any astronauts to fix it because it's basically moving far too fast uh, in the sky. Uh, now, I to sure. A couple questions here. One being, yeah. so it is in the sky, and I we kind of touched on this last week, but I'd love you to kind of fill this in for us. Um, you mentioned that X ray tel X rays X ray light can go through some things that visible light can't go through, but there's also the case that this is up in space for a reason, right? Yes, that's a great question. It was a question I was saving for the audience, but I can answer it now. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the, the, the reason, the reason ultimately um, for 
for uh, X-ray telescopes uh, having to be on satellites is that we need to get above the atmosphere of the, uh, of the Earth because luckily we are actually protected from X-rays coming all the way down to the ground. So X-rays are not very good for you. That's why they put all this protective stuff when you go to the doctor to get your X-rays taken because they don't want X-rays to be hitting uh, the wrong bits of your body and it's only just a little bit of a dose. So basically we have this big shield all around us, which is uh, the atmosphere, which it turns out that the separation, um, uh, the nature of the molecules and atoms that make up the atmosphere is very good at absorbing all of the x-rays that are coming from outer space. So we're actually protected from that, uh, luckily. We're not protected from you know the optical light, which is coming from the sun, luckily, because otherwise <laughs> we wouldn't get any warmth uh, when the sun is up. Um, or any light uh, to allow us to see. But yeah, that's a great question, Erica. Great, and then I, thank you for that answer. I also have one more question. Um, you mentioned the detector at the end. Uh, how, what, what is that detector like? Is it similar to anything we might be familiar with? Oh yeah, certainly. It's, it's very similar to what your um, standard uh, digital camera in your phone it's like the materials themselves are a little bit different and it's designed in a slightly different way, but it's basically just a bunch, uh, it's, it's just a lot of silicon, which is what your standard uh, digital camera is made of, uh, that when it gets hit by a photon, it just says, oh, I just got hit by a photon and that photon had this energy. So it's that simple of a technology. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated <laughs> than that, but the actual principle is basically the same as your digital camera, the, your standard digital camera. So yes. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so in order to put it into, um, into perspective, this is that golden bit that I was showing you in the previous slide. This is how big Chandra is. It's that this is the place where the mirrors are housed. So that's how large this wow. telescope is, right? Because in that diagram, it looks, you know, the size of your computer um, uh, or wherever you're seeing this, but um, in real life, it's very big. And, and these are the people, uh, the, the folks in, in TRW out in, in California before it was launched, while they were still working on testing it, that it wasn't gonna fall apart once we put it in a rocket and launched it out in the sky. Um, these are the people at Kodak, um, which, you know, some of the younger, people in the audience might not know about, which is a famous photography uh, and mirror development uh, company for many years. Um, and at the time that Chandra was built, th these people had the best technology in order to do mirrors. And this is what the mirrors look like for Chandra. This is actually the mirrors being designed themselves. Now you might notice that they don't look like what you think of as a mirror, right? You can see that it's reflecting light on the side, but you might think, well, that doesn't look like a mirror. That looks like a cylindrical onion, right? You have these like yeah. <laughs> shells, right? Cylindrical shells that are like inset into um, each other. Um, and that's a curious design. Now, there's a reason for that, that it's not just a mirror that is flat, uh, uh, like going towards you. And I'm just gonna show you a quick video here. So this is, when you say mirror, this is exactly what you think of. You think of, you know, light coming towards a uh, surface and then hitting it and then being reflected back. Now, what I'm showing you here in the, in the video, it's basically what's happening with an X-ray mirror. It's more of a grazing incidence. So it just barely hits the mirror and then changes direction. And that's why we have to put the detector so far away from um, where the mirrors are is so that we allow the light to all be focused into a very small place even though it only barely graced the mirror. And the more mirrors you have, the more the photons have surfaces to hit off, right? Now, yeah. the, the thought here, why we need to do it like this is that um, as we were mentioning before, X-rays are actually very good at going through stuff. Uh, and most mirrors wouldn't be able to uh, reflect an X-ray that comes uh, basically perpendicular to the mirror uh, and reflect it backwards. It, the, the X-ray will go right through. Oh. So you need to put it in a grazing incidence because that actually allows you to 
to reflect it much more easily. It's much more efficient as a way. And this was a technology that was only developed in the 1960s and 70s. And it was developed right here in Cambridge, by the way. That's incredible. I never It is really that. cool. Yeah, it is awesome. Now, so, you know, I told you this thing was big. It is roughly the size of a school bus in total, you know, even with its uh, arms, the solar panel sort of uh, folded in. And it was launched out into space in, in this uh, space shuttle in, 19, in 1999, um, July of 1999. So last year we celebrated 20 years since launch. And here you can see the, the video of the space shuttle uh, being launched with it. As a matter of fact, it was the heaviest load ever launched in the shuttle. Really? Um, yeah, because uh, it's just super heavy, super big. Those mirrors are very, very weighty. And 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 the whole, and you can see here uh, on the right, the image that I'm showing you is actually Chandra right before it was deployed from the cargo bay of the shuttle. So there was um, 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 astronaut Katie, Coleman, um, who has had many, many flights out into space, was in charge of actually deploying Chandra. And this was very exciting. Um, of course, they were very happy for uh, the, the telescope to actually be dislodged from the, from the cargo bay because Chandra's journey didn't finish the moment that it made it out into orbit with a shuttle. It had its own little rocket attached to it because it has to go even further out into space after the shuttle left it. Uh, so basically the astronauts were very happy that this was deployed uh, uh, effectively and efficiently because you don't want an extra bit of rocket inside of your own rocket, right? Because yeah. rockets are filled with fuel and you don't want to be shaking your uh, fuel tanks all that much, or especially in a launch. So um, yeah, so that's, that's the video. Yep. That's so cool. I just want to let our audience know if they want to learn more about Katie Coleman, they can go to the Chandra website, right? There's materials there on her as well as some definitely. Other women related to the uh, Chandra X-ray telescope. Yes, definitely. I mean, the commander uh, of this of, of this shuttle flight was also uh, a woman, the first uh, shuttle commander um, to be a woman. Um, and there's all of that information is at the CXE website. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and then you mentioned that it was 20 years ago that that's right last year that Chandra launched. Was it yeah. supposed to last that long? It was. It was actually designed to last for five years. That was basically what you know the entire project was designed for. Um, but very smartly, scientists, uh, even if they only get money to do something that is going to last for five years. They try and make sure that everything that they're putting into the telescope is stuff that can last as long as possible. And basically that's how well Chandra was designed. Chandra has very few uh, expendables on it. It doesn't, it doesn't use any fuel in order to move or to change direction or anything like that. It doesn't have to cool itself uh, more than what it's, uh, you know, the fact that when the sun is not hitting it, it's actually getting cool. There's there's nothing that actually consumes power, which is one of the things that is usually important for a second sum. Um, basically, that uh, determines the expiration date of a mission. Wow. So it's already gone more than 15 years over how long it was supposed to last. That's right. In July, it turns uh, 21. It'll start. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. It is really cool. So I'll, it, these are uh, things and sort of scientific topics that I'm not going to touch on today because I'm going to talk about supernova remnants, but I'm just going to sh quickly show you some of the stuff that Chandra can do that is not supernova remnants. Um, so on the top left uh, here, you can actually see some images um, of Jupiter. Um, this, these are actually optical images. They're, they're beautiful optical images, but you can see superimposed some um, purple stuff. And that's basically Chandra observations of x-rays coming from the poles of, um, of Jupiter, somewhat similar to uh, our uh, northern lights on uh, Aurora Borealis and Aurora, um, yeah, the Aurora in, in, on, on Earth. This is basically a similar effect uh, just out in Jupiter. 
So that's that's a really cool result because it's you know not that far away, but we don't get to see X-rays from many different things. Uh, here in the middle, we have the Crab Nebula, which is one of the things that Jordan was talking about uh, mm -hmm. this morning—a pulsar wind nebula. So basically, a pulsar is this thing that is also left over after a, super, uh, a star explodes, a massive star explodes, and and they're super dense. It's almost like a, a very very large nucleus. Um, very very massive and they're spinning very very fast and they're producing all of these super energetic particles and that's that's what we can see in the x-rays there uh, on the right these are two two normal galaxies that are nearby each other uh, this is an optical image but everything that you see in purple is actually x-ray uh, observations uh, mm -hmm. so basically what we're seeing there is the gas in the galaxy uh, as it traces the arms of the galaxy themselves, right? Because when you see a galaxy, you're normally just seeing the stars that make it up. But this is actually showing you the gas where all of those stars live. Wow. Uh, here we can see something even larger. This is a cluster of galaxies and all of the gas that surrounds the clusters of galaxies. Does, these are the largest structures in the universe. Um, and for brevity, the other two are really interesting, but for brevity, I'm just going to skip over them right now. So now the remnants of exploding stars. So just a quick introduction to what a, a massive star looks like uh, towards the end of its life. Um, so it looks basically like an onion with different shells. Um, and so the basics for those that don't know this is that stars are these big balls of hydrogen to start with. And, and they are so large and massive that in the, right in the center of them, they get hot enough in order for protons and protons to join and uh, become helium uh, nuclei. Now, when that happens, you release energy. So basically it's nuclear fusion heating you up from the inside and preventing the star from gravitationally collapsing. Okay, those are complicated things and you're more than welcome to ask me more about them. But, but to cut this story short, that, that happens right at the center. Uh, so basically you're turning hydrogen into helium and then that keeps the whole thing very, very hot. And that's what we see the sun. That's what we see, uh, the, the sun we see uh, from Earth is actually producing a lot of photons because it's a very, very hot ball of hydrogen. And that heat is coming from hydrogen turning into helium. Now, when stars grow much older, you can think of that hydrogen basically running out towards the middle. Um, the stuff on the outside is a little too cool. The stuff on the inside is running out of hydrogen. So basically, um, it starts contracting a little bit and it gets hot enough for heliums to do fusion as well, just like the hydrogens were doing, but two heliums start like um, uh, being fused together and making something heavier and so on and so forth. Um, into, uh, so basically you end up with a, a very large layer of hydrogen on the outside and then uh, helium on the inside where it's actually turning into something um, larger than helium, um, in this case, carbon. Um, now that process repeats itself. So you run out of helium to turn into carbon and then the carbon starts burning um, and then, and so on and so forth. And you end up basically with this like onion shaped layer. Very complicated story to just say that right at the end, right before the star explodes, it has this very, very dense core inside, which is made out of iron. And then it's surrounded by stuff like silicon and magnesium, et cetera. Why, why is it iron in the middle right before it explodes? Why do we know that? Um, but it turns out that if you join two iron uh, nuclei, they don't fuse. So they don't release any energy. So basically, there's no way that you can grab iron and heat it up enough that it'll fuse with another iron and produce heat. So that's why basically that's when the star dies is because it stops producing enough heat to sort of to stop it from collapsing. Now, as you can imagine, co collapsing stars are very complicated. And here I'm showing you a simulation done in Germany of what the gas looks like right before the star explodes. And this is, you're looking at the last few minutes of the life of a star uh, as a simulation. Um, 
And you can see that all kinds of stuff is moving around at different speeds. Um, you can imagine this is, this is only showing you one type of gas, but you can put on top of that all the different layers of the elements that I just showed you being sort of convected like, like boiling water, right? Uh, you have like air and water mixing, et cetera. You have the same thing with helium and magnesium and silicon all joining. Now, this is really, really interesting, but this is where um, what I call an extreme physics um, experiment, because there's no way that we can reproduce anything similar on Earth. So this is the only place in the universe where this type of explosion is happening, this type of collapse. And in order to understand our physics the best we can, we need to understand this phenomenon because we're not gonna be able to repeat it here on Earth. The closest we can get is through computers, but as you can imagine, simulations with computers, they can, they can do great things, but they have limitations um, because we don't know all of the physics to start with. So you need to actually compare it to the thing that is happening. And that's where Chandra comes in. I'm gonna, two quick things there. One, when sure. you were describing that onion, yeah. um, I just wanna let our audience know when they hear people say you're made of star stuff, that's the reason why, right? Yeah. All of the elements beyond hydrogen are are made in a star. That's where all the where everything we're made up of comes from. Exactly. No, no. It, it it gets made into the into the onion and then it gets ejected out into space during the supernova explosion. But even further, um, all the stuff that is heavier than iron that you couldn't make in the star as it was burning, actually gets made in the explosion itself, because in the explosion, irons are fused with other stuff because you don't need to be producing heat and you end up building everything else, like even the, like the radioactive stuff like uranium and plutonium, all of that stuff that we find on earth, that's actually made in that, during that explosion, which is incredible. But yeah, it's a good, really good point. I, that's incredible. I didn't realize how much of the stuff was made in the explosion itself, so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, as, as a matter of fact, a lot of the iron that we end up seeing is not the iron that was right at the core, but stuff that was actually made into nickel and then decayed into iron. It's it's super interesting, but really complicated, as you can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And then and what, is, oh, go ahead. No, 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 you said. I was just going to point out uh, the simulation, because one thing I've been trying to help our audience kind of um, get a grasp of is when things are made on a computer out of data um, or our understandings of the universe versus when things are made from data collected. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that that when you show this simulation, it's something that was made on a computer based on scientists' best knowledge of how the universe works. Exactly, it's basically from first principles. It's just using physics, the physics that we understand, um, that we think we understand, sort of putting it into the computer and saying, okay, so these are the sort of starting ingredients. Let's see what happens when you let it evolve in time uh, and let it collapse. So yeah, you're completely right. Now, the way that you constrain some of the parameters, so basically the way in which you, you know what is a good starting point for your simulation is by the observations. And this is exactly what we're showing you here in this slide is how Chandra contributes to those simulations. Now, the, the image that I'm showing you on the right is of the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. It's a very famous supernova remnant, very, very bright. It was actually observed in the sky. It's only a few hundred years old. Um, and it's actually one of the, the, the collapses of these massive stars. And on the left, I'm showing you what the color coding is for the image on the right. So you have silicon in red, sulfur in yellow, calcium in green, the iron is in purple, and then what we call the blast wave, which is um, non-thermal material in, in blue. Now you can see that the blue stuff is, seems to be a little bit on the, towards the, the outside. And that's basically because the shock as it moves outwards, it's, it's very good at non-thermally accelerating particles. That's a really complicated, this is, <laughs> we're not gonna get into too much today. But it's really interesting because we can actually see that um, uh, blast wave expanding. But you can actually see the distribution of the elements inside. And those are the elements that used to make up the star before it blew up. And you can see what the distribution of those is. And it doesn't seem all that um, 
um, perfectly uh, spherical and isotropic, etc. And that's actually reflected in the simulation that I was showing you before, right before the right. thing blew up, you had all of these bubbles of stuff moving around be, right before it blows up and then just blows everything out of proportion. Now, a super interesting thing from this image that I wanna point to is that I showed you that in the onion shape, the perfect diagram, you know, beautiful um, spherical cow of a, of a <laughs> model that I showed you, right at the middle, there was iron, right? But the purple stuff does not seem to be right in the middle after the explosion. It's actually the stuff that seems to be further outwards, especially in comparison to uh, sulfur and calcium, et cetera. If you disregard this like jet uh, structure right here. So this is how Chandra contributes to uh, us understanding how to constrain those simulations and how to better understand um, how a star uh, looked like before it exploded and what the explosion mechanism looks like. And as we, you know, and one of the big advantages of looking at the sky in x-rays for a whole 20 years is that we can make beautiful images like the one I'm showing you here, which show you how Cas uh, A is actually expanding and how it, the gas inside of it is moving um, in time because we look at the same supernova remnant almost every year ever since it was launched, since uh, Chandra was launched. So you can actually see, you know, the, the thing that I mentioned before, the, the arcs on the outside, you can actually see them expanding. If I just keep my cursor there, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take it to the beginning. If I just put my cursor there and you just compare how it seems to be approaching the cursor. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing that we can do with Chandra, which is very exciting. And it helps us understand how this thing, what it was the star would really look like right before it blew up. Because of course, we don't really know. We can't see on the inside of star of a star until it explodes. And then we need to understand the explosion mechanism. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it there. Yeah. Okay. So I actually have a question. So we meant we showed how big of the night sky uh say is, but how big is it in space? Like how? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so Cas A is uh, what we call uh, a few parsecs in size. Now, let me really quickly put that in my calculator so that I can put it into perspective. Uh, in terms of, uh, miles that would be <laughs> okay this is a hard number to say is uh, about one times 10 to the 14 miles okay so it's tiny in comparison to the size of the entire galaxy mm -hmm. but it's much much larger uh, at this point than the size of the solar system Okay, that helps, right? Small, okay. smaller than a galaxy, bigger than our solar system. That exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, would you mind going back to the image with the colors for a second? The different because sure. uh, the other thing. So I told you we've been learning a little bit about whether or not something is um, a simulation or observational data. I think yep. this is a really great one for our, our audience to help start understanding that. Um, Sometimes scientists, and with help of those that make the images beautiful, color different pieces of data differently to help understand an image. Definitely. No, that's a, that's a really good point. And I didn't delve into that so much, and I should have. Um, so what you're seeing on the right is not really what you would see with your uh, eyes, right? Even if you had a really good telescope to look at Cassiopeia A, the thing that you see on the, on the right is not what you would see. Again, these are x-rays which your eye cannot see. We actually fake the colors. So we give uh, lights of different energies, we code them with colors. So basically a silicon, um, a silicon ion, uh, which is basically an atom that has lost a bunch of their electrons, um, produces light at a very specific frequency, which translates to energy. Um, and sulfur 
also emits light, but a slightly different frequency than your silicon. And the calcium is the same, and the iron is the same. So basically what we do is we make images in very, very, very small frequency bands. So we just grab all of the light that we got at a certain frequency, and we make that light red. We get all of the light that was coming from a different frequency, and we make that light yellow. And we specifically choose those frequencies so that they match the frequencies at which silicon and sulfur and calcium emit light. And that's how we end up being able to reconstruct this beautiful image on the right, which is basically fake colors, but are telling you something that is very real. I think that's a really great way of putting it. I think uh, oftentimes people wonder that about NASA images, right? They're like, is it real? And the data and the information it's conveying is very real, but it is not something we can see with our own eyes. Definitely, definitely. I mean, you could switch the the sort of the order of these colors as you so fit, right? You could color silicon in blue and then calcium in uh, purple and iron in, in green, and it would all look different, but it would still tell you that the iron seems to be a little bit on the outside and that the silicon seems to be on the inside of that, et cetera. So the, the physical reality doesn't change. This is just basically highlighting it so that we, we, with our human eyes, can actually make sense of the situation. And if folks listened to our after chat with Kim Arkan, she talks a little bit about how the decisions of what colors are made, that there are some more consistent decisions, but sometimes when you put those together, it doesn't look very good. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I do this for my papers all the time. It's like, yeah, let's let's go very strict on this choice of colors. And then you're like, no, 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 this doesn't look pretty. I <laughs> want people to look at the image and think that it looks pretty, but I still wanted to show the physical reality of the situation. So you just play around a little bit with the colors, but the actual physical reality that they're depicting is totally, real. That's a great way of putting it. So we've got a few questions online now. Um, one is uh, at Tracy underscore Karen wants to know what your specific role or responsibilities with Chandra are. Oh, great. Um, I don't know if this is an insider question, but I, I love that somebody asked that. Um, I'm super proud of it. So 50% of my time is done is, is spent doing actual research. So I look at images of supernova remnants and I try and get science out of them. That's 50% of my time. And the other 50% of my time, I am part of the science operations team of Chandra, specifically part of the mission planning. Now, what is the science operations team? Uh, these are the, uh, a very large group of scientists who are in charge of uh, leading and controlling and administering Chandra. And specifically within that, the mission planning team, what we do is we, um, choose specifically in which direction Chandra is going to be looking at every minute of the day. Now, we don't, we don't choose the target. The targets are chosen every year since, since Chandra belongs to all of us, to the whole of humanity, and mostly to NASA, but to you know, scientists all over the world. We open every year a process called um, uh, a peer review panel where basically people submit their research proposals uh, to this uh, large system, and then we collate them into different topics, et cetera, and then we con convene a large uh, congress of scientists from all around the world to choose which of these proposals are the best ones. We don't, we don't choose them. We convene scientists who specialize in the different areas of each subject, and those people choose yeah, so from this 70 proposals, these are the 10 best. And from this other 70 proposals, these are the 10 best. Um, supernova remnant proposals, these are the best 10. And we basically, um, the, the director of Chandra grabs that um, bag of proposals uh, and gives them to us and we organize them throughout the year uh, so that um, uh, Chandra points in that direction at every minute, um, looking at targets that people propose for, but um, in the order that makes more sense for the spacecraft. And basically there's, uh, by making more sense, it has to do with the health of the space, uh, of the telescope and efficiency as we move around the sky and, and things like that. 
things that keep it running for 20 years. <laughs> exactly. Great. Um, oh, here's another great question from at Trace Karen. Uh, what's your most exciting discovery made by the Chandra X-ray telescope? And then also maybe what's the most exciting thing you personally have found out? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, those are good questions. Um, so Chandra has done many important things. Some of them are a little bit difficult to convey uh, to the general public because they're like this large catalog that teaches a lot about cosmology and the structure of the universe, et cetera, but they're, they're a little bit hard to say. But um, I think I've, I might have a couple of slides. I mean, aside from looking at supernova remnants and understanding what them, you know, the star that used to make them, uh, how it exploded, et cetera, like the ones that I've just shown you, which is super interesting and super important in science. Um, for example, this is one of the first light images of Chandra. This was looking at a, um, at a black hole that has a little, um, a little disc around it. And people were expecting this to be a point source, just like a basically one point of light, just like a star. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that when they looked, they saw this arm uh, to, the, to the right uh, in your, in your um, screens. And everyone got worried because they thought that it was a defect on the mirrors that was making this like, that was actually losing some of the, the definition and actually making it streak towards one side. It turns out it is not, it's actually one of the jets of the black hole that wow. is sort of, yeah. So that's a really, really interesting result that everyone got very, very excited about. Um, and we've continued to do that type of observation. Here uh, you see another uh, black hole and it's jet, and it's very, very clear on, on the bottom image. You can see the, the jet as, it's, as it spreads. So basically, Chandra has taught us a lot about black holes and how they emit jets. It's super, super interesting stuff. And this is this black hole in particular is very famous because it's the same one that was imaged uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope last year. Uh, and it's the first time that we actually see the black bit on the inside of the black hole surrounded mm -hmm. by all of the light, which is very cool. Chandra doesn't see that specifically because we don't have quite the resolution of EHD, but we can see in the large scale, the jet that that same black hole is producing, which is really exciting. And one last thing that we can see, as I mentioned before, Chandra is very good at charting where all the hot gas is located in the universe. And it turns out that the universe has this very uh, peculiar structure that looks a little bit like a spider web, like a 3D spider web. Um, and here I'm showing you, this is a simulation. This is not a real um, image, but basically Chandra helps us um, map out all of this hot gas, which is much better at mapping out where matter is in, in the universe than just starlight because stars are in many places where there is gas, but there is gas where there's no stars sometimes. So the, basically being able to map out the gas has allowed us to understand this uh, incredible cosmic web that surrounds us a lot better. Absolutely, yeah. And if you're interested about that, we've actually had a couple talks where we've mentioned uh, the cosmic web. Uh, so check those out on the other Astro Chats videos and how Chandra has played a role. Now that you have a better understanding of Chandra's role in that, yeah. And what about for you personally? Is there something within your history of science that you've been particularly proud of? That I've been particular so. I'm very interested in, in, in supernova remnants, as I mentioned before, and I'm very interested specifically on, um, you remember when I said that I wasn't gonna talk much about the, uh, the purple part, the, the blue part on the outside, et cetera, the blast wave itself. I am particularly interested in that. And, uh, and at, this, at this point in time, right now, I'm actually studying this specific supernova remnant, that blue part, and I'm really studying how those shocks are moving and how they're changing velocity in time. Because Chandra uh, observations and specifically Chandra observations of Cas A are the only ones ever done that can actually determine the velocity of these shocks um, and basically how that changes through the years because we, we had never had a telescope this good before and we had never had um, a telescope that was this good before that looked at the same object for 20 years. Right, so it's given us this wealth of data, which is amazing. And right now, I'm really 
sort of zeroing on that. And I'm also connecting how fast those things are moving outwards with how thin they are. And the thinness of those filaments um, is super important to understand the actual physics of the shock. Wow, that sounds yeah. really cool. And yeah, I think that's one thing that people always wonder about, like the time frame of studying things uh, in our universe can be very difficult. Uh, yes, it can. Yeah, definitely. And and that's that's when when we talk about uh, sort of uh, angular resolution is really important. And angular resolution is basically how good your telescope is at resolving little bits of the sky. Um, Chandra's uh, angular resolution, which is unmatched um, in in history for an extra telescope, it's it's uh, quite outstanding, um, and it allows me to see things that move a tiny tiny fraction of a degree in the sky um, per year if they moved in in a, in a few years. So so yeah, that's so cool. Um. So now we've got some more basic science questions. As sure. well. um, interesting wording, but I'm going to read it this way and then maybe we can work through the wording. Oh, I thought I turned that announcement off. Uh, <laughs> how long does light last if it never impacts an object? So in other words, does light ever end? It doesn't actually. Um, the way we understand the universe today uh, unless light interacts with something, it just moves freely uh, unchanged. Um, it doesn't actually have uh, impacting something or hitting something. It's uh, a complicated statement in physics, right? Because um, it turns out that if you think microscopically, uh, there's all this space between atoms, etc. So it's actually kind of hard to pinpoint what actually hitting something is. Uh, but light, for example, can be deflected, um, just like you know the planets go around the uh, the sun because of the gravitational pull of the sun. So you know all these planets are basically caught in the um, the web of the sun. Um, when light comes close to the sun, it will actually deflect a little bit because the gravitational pull of the sun will actually make it change direction a little bit. Now it doesn't make it change uh, its intensity. And it doesn't change um, necessarily its frequency. So basically, it's not losing energy or intensity. Uh, so it wouldn't disappear. It just would change direction. OK. That was really helpful. Um, so then kind of to nail down, drill down a little bit more on what you said about hitting things. Um, so what happens to light when it does impact an object or hit something? Um, it normally turns into something else, normally heat. So um, um, light, optical light is, is very good at hitting certain types of materials and heating them up. That's what we feel warmth when the sun is hitting us, right? Mm -hmm. um, it also reflects, just like I showed you in a mirror, you know, many things are like mirrors. That's the reason we see colors when we walk down the street. That's why we, our eyes perceive light that has hit the car and then come to our eyes is basically because the light reflected. It didn't all just get warm, um, used up, warming up the car or the car seat, et cetera. Some of the light actually reflects and comes back to you, you know, to you. And you can say, oh, there's a car right in front of me. It's because the light hit it and reflected. So there's a lot of reflection. There's a lot of absorption and turning into heat. Um, some more complicated things can happen as well. Like for example, light can actually bump out an electron out of an atom. Uh -huh. um, and, and basically that makes that atom a little bit unbalanced if you think of it in charge, because basically an atom is a system where you have some uh, positive charges rather than nucleus, uh, and then you have some negative charges outside and they're the same number. So basically the charge of the atom is balanced, right? But if you bump one of those electrons out, it turns out that now you have more protons in the nucleus than the number of electrons that you have outside. So that means that you have a positive charge in your um, in your atom. That's the kind of thing, more complicated thing, can, but even more complicated things than that can happen. But that's one of the things that can happen. All right, thank you. Uh, so we've got just a few more minutes here. And I just want to ask you uh, something that I've been asking a lot of our guests is, 
kind of your experience into astronomy? Have you always been interested in it? Was it always easy for you? Were there any classes you struggled with or ones that you found particularly interesting? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the answer is no. So in astronomy, there is a large number of astronomers who always wanted to be an astronomer. They had a telescope since they were little, they looked at the night sky and they thought, oh, the wonders of the universe. I didn't, I was more interested in how things worked on the inside. Right, I was a you know, I was a teenager. The first time I took apart a TV because I wanted to understand how the TV worked on the inside. That didn't mean good things for the TV itself because of course <laughs> I could have put it back together. But I like learning about things uh, on the inside, so for understanding how things work, etc. And that's basically what's dragged me into exactly this. Supernova remnants are, you know, an amazing way of turning your star inside out and seeing what's in it. Right. Um, so that's kind of where I come from into, into the astrophysics world. I'm interested in the real physics part rather than the, the wonders of the universe, even though I have actually learned to uh, be awed and amazed by like how incredible the night sky can be, or even the day sky. Um, I remember the, the first time I saw a, a full solar eclipse just a few years back. I, I went to this conference that they had organized around the eclipse thinking, yeah, you know, it's just going to be, you know, a dimming of the light and that's, that's it. And then I saw that, that solar eclipse and I thought, oh my God, this is like magic. This is incredible. Um, so I've learned to really appreciate uh, the night sky, etc. but I come more from the, how things work on the inside. And in terms of subjects when I was little that were more difficult or that things were that were easy. Admittedly, my, both my parents were engineers. So I got a lot of like home coaching in math and physics, which admittedly made that type of subject a lot easier for me. Um, I was honestly more interested in the arts when I was younger. Uh, when I, when I, right before I went to college, I actually wanted to study cinematography. That was the thing that I wanted to go into. Um, and, and in terms of some of the difficult subjects that I had to face when I was little, I remember struggling with chemistry and biology. I thought that they were very difficult. And math, I think it was easy for me, especially because my mom was very good at explaining it. Mm. And, and I think many people struggle with math and they think that math is difficult, even though it really isn't. It's just that it hasn't been taught uh, very well to them. That was me, sorry. <laughs> All right, no problem. I was like, <laughs> um, <laughs> figured we see our yeah. just for a few minutes at the end. Sure. Um, so yeah, so that's that's roughly where um, um, I struggled the most was with things like chemistry and biology, which are kind of sciences, but they're a little bit difficult, different than physics and math. In physics and math, the rules of the game are very clear. Mm. And I feel that in biology and, and, and chemistry, I sometimes got lost in trying to think of them as a specific set of rules, but they just have so many exceptions that it would just confuse me. <laughs> You're like those rules are not straightforward. That's right, exactly. Interesting. Um, so we're almost to an end here, but I've got two last questions. Hopefully we can get through them if maybe we'll run over a minute. Uh, but one is, What's one thing that might surprise people about you? Maybe something that doesn't align with the stereotypical idea of what a scientist is or who a scientist, what they like to do, those kinds of things. Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, okay, so not things that would definitely surprise you, but things that are, are peculiar about, you know, life as scientists, et cetera. When you when you're in school, it's tough. It's you know you have to study your uh, hard, and you when you are in grad school, you have to work really hard to do your papers and for everyone to know you, um, etc. <clears throat> but uh, since I you know got my PhD and everything, my life turned into something very similar to what everyone else's life turned into, which I didn't expect myself. So that my job is like from, you know, my starting time to my end time, it's like office hours. And then after that, I don't worry about my job. I, unless I'm on call, which is just a whole another uh, um, kind of uh, beans, but um, unless I'm on call, it's just a normal life like everyone else. And I don't, 
think or uh, worry about black holes and the cosmic web when I'm not working. Um, I mean, I love these topics, but you know, I go home and I just, I love sports. I love watching soccer on TV. I love running, uh, long distance running. And that's the kind of thing that I do to entertain myself um, very often. Aside from that, things that do surprise people about me is because you see me nowadays, uh, I used to have dreadlocks when I was young and a big beard, etc. So many, yeah, many people said that, it's, yeah, <laughs> I, I used to look a little bit like a caveman. Now that's a little bit surprising to me. Yeah, I wouldn't have imagined that. No. <laughs> well, that's a fun that, one. That's right. Have people interested in science can look so many different ways, right? I think exactly. Right. Uh, and our last question is, what piece of advice would you have for a young person, middle school or high school, that's interested in science, technology, engineering, math? Uh, what piece of advice would you give them today? Right. So I, I have always found in my own experience that things that you're curious about are the things that you're going to get best at, right? So I would suggest, okay, uh, choose the way that you want to go in life in terms of what makes you curious, what really piques your interest, rather than thinking, oh, I want to have the life that this person has, and that person has this profession, so I'm going to choose that profession. Just go after whatever really makes you like wonder. Like, like uh, I feel that for physics and astrophysics for me is particularly a bit like a riddle and I'm always trying to work at it. That's why I find it interesting and curious and I just keep on going at it uh, for a long time. It's basically because I am curious about it. And I think that's the best fuel for any career in the world. Now, in terms of people telling you that you can't do stuff, etc. I mean, this is very standard answer, but don't pay attention to anyone that tells you that you can't do stuff if you're convinced that that's the way that you want to go and you are prepared to put in the time, effort, and energy that is going to take you there. Because I, I truly believe, I mean, I am a Venezuelan American, um, you know, coming from a Hispanic community. Um, my parents are engineers and they both worked in factories and industry, et cetera. And when I told them that I wanted to lead this academic life, they were like, oh, okay. But they were supportive at the same time. And they were like, yeah, we believe in you. You don't always find those people that believe in you. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't base uh, your efforts on whether people are pushing you to do it. Um, base it on, base, on your interests and how, um, how passionate you are about what you want to go after. I think that's some, some great pieces of advice to end for today. So thank you so much for that. Um, sure. Yeah, follow your passions. And, you know, as long as you're willing to do the work, you can often find your way to something, a career that will make you happy and successful. So exactly. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Daniel. This was fantastic. No problem. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot. This is one of my favorite things. I tell I tell our audience that every day is I get to learn so much from these talks. So uh, hopefully they're learning as much as I am. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, and thank you all out there for joining us again today. Um, we'll be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, with Dr. Marie, Ma I'm going to say her name, her last name wrong, Machicek. Uh, she'll correct me tomorrow, so I'll say it right tomorrow. Uh, we'll be talking about galaxy communities and how they interact and grow. Uh, thank you all again, and thank you, Daniel. We'll see you next time. <laughs>